Fraser T. Smith. Good to meet you, man. How you doing, man? I'm really, good. I'm good. Really we'll nice we'll sanitize you. after. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, amazing to be here. Amazing to be in this studio. Welcome. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate it. With you as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, before we get into anything, how how are you in these current times? You know what? It's a, I think most most people I speak to very lucky and, and I feel the same. You know, you, you feel very lucky to be healthy and, and obviously this time is you know, a challenging time for everybody. So, you know, you, you can sometimes feel a bit guilty about saying I'm amazing. But, you know, the record has taken a, which I know we'll get into, but it's taken a, a year to make and we're about to release it. So, so I'm really ex- excited. Obviously, yeah, it's a challenging time for everyone. So just about to go into this this second wave, the second lockdown. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's see where that that takes us. But just just trying to stay positive and trying to stay hopeful. Well, you've got an amazing space to be able to do that now. Um, yeah. I mean, your your studio in in West London that you previously worked in was incredible, but this is a different level. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, the, the studio that you were in before was amazing. We made made so many great records there, you know, from from like early Mickey Echo stuff to Gangsters and Prayer and Psychodrama. And I think like my my mindset at the time, you know, living in London and 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 just just being like getting in super early and and making it feel the the physical location of it for obviously you know but for for everyone else was was in this kind of block loads of other studios but kind of like a lot of almost like business going on like lots of creative management and everything else it was just such an amazing place but just deciding to to move out here like i really felt at the end of the psychodrama record that it was like an end of a chapter of i think good things come in three so the the three things for me creatively were Made in the Manor, working with Kane on that yep. record, and then Kang Sons and Prayer and the Psychodrama. And I just felt like I didn't want to repeat myself. And I think that studios have their have their time. You know, maybe this is a studio for the rest of my life. I don't know, but but I definitely feel you can you can evolve by changing your physical location. So we decided to move out of London, and yeah, we're here out in the country, and artists love it. I've made my yeah. whole record here. I love it. Incredible. You love it. You love it. <laughs> We're all here. So, how did you uh, how did you find it? We actually were some friends of ours that were selling it, and so we knew the house. And the house had this really. It was hard to believe now because it's been it's been done so beautifully. But it was a a very basic barn, like a sort of barn that you wouldn't even put horses in. <laughs> you know, it's that basic. Like literally, stones and mud on the floor. You know, so but I could see the potential in that. And it was always my dream to to have like a living and, and working space that that artists could come down and and just lose themselves in the music, really. And and so far so good, you know, in terms of the artists that, that have come down and stayed and it's definitely a different mindset mm. out here from London. You know, I love London, it's great for getting things done, but I think for for absolute creativity, being a bit closer to nature is, is really good. Do you think that requires a different level of intuition and sort of tuning into yourself? I think so. I think I think you get to the point in your career where where the the decisions that I make are, are probably more about the ideas that I have and more about the concepts and the the ways that I can right. help artists and and now shape my own artist career. So I've always found that being in the country for me helps me think outside the box a bit more you know and i'm very can be pretty abstract whereas in london it's very much about that high energy right like i said you know being able to make a quick beat and then bounce it at the end of the session and and that sort of mindset whereas i think here it's naturally just a bit more chilled and 100%. a bit more open incredible well you mentioned some you know big names uh kano stormzy dave the projects you've been working on as of late in your previous studio. Um, what I sort of really wanted to just get a, a basis of first was why music for you? I think from a very young age, it became clear that that 
that I had an affinity to music in terms of being around. I remember like my, my nan had a piano that I just was fascinated with and I'd just go over and she was like a self-taught pianist where like back in the day, people would literally gather around the piano, you know, like obviously way pre-internet and you know, yeah, yeah. all the things that we do nowadays, but literally, you know, like in the war almost like gathering around in the pub. And I just was fascinated by seeing her play and, and, and actually just working out stuff. And then, yeah, school was pretty normal, but I definitely wasn't, wasn't top of the class and was into sport, but music was the thing that just always, I could just lose myself in it. And then got my first guitar quite young and just used to love playing that. And, and just music was just really like my life growing up, even though I didn't have, didn't have lessons and I didn't, I was just always self-taught, but for a very young age that that was what i don't know it was always like a like a a place that i could go music mm -hmm. that would that would give me solace from whatever was was going on you know it's when you grow up things can be can be pretty tough so it was always like a a place that i could just lose myself in right. so and it's it's still the same now was there any particular artists or type of music that you lent towards i guess when you're young you you're listening to the sort of music that that your mum and dad play in yeah. the house so <laughs> I was really wide ranging you know from from like Philly soul my mum <clears throat> spent a while in America so she she sort of absorbed lots of the soul music in the in the late 60s and 70s and um but then my dad was in would be playing classical and jazz so people like Dave Brubeck and you know the classic classical composers so it's pretty wide ranging but then when I got to secondary school I was at school with Tom Rowlands from the Chemical Brothers okay and it was really interesting how he he his development his obviously massive success and incredible music that that he's made with with Ed over the years he was basically doing the similar stuff at age 14 you know right. he had a drum machine and playing the guitars and, and he was an amazing guy to introduce me to he introduced me to public enemy Jimi hendrix new order joy division you know just give me vinyl and i'd yeah. go home and just like ingest this amazing music and just you know growing up as i did kind of around here there's not a lot going on culturally so so you i think you're even more receptive to to all this amazing music that that you're hit with and you you don't really understand where it's been made or mm. you can't just at the time i couldn't just go and google public enemy to kind of get a, a feel but you you just got this this sense of like power and an unease and and unrest you know and and then obviously the older i got the more i i learned about you know these amazing artists and and became like very inspired by the stories yeah and and you know you mentioned amazing artists you have a you have a roster that you've worked with or in some some capacity um what i was I was listening to an interview you did before and and something you said stuck out and it was that vulnerability is is the one thing that an artist maybe needs in order to elevate their music to heights that can reach depths of people um how are you able to spot that in the artists that you work with I, I honestly have thought about this because if I could, if I could bottle it, I could maybe sell it, sell it you know, to, <laughs> <laughs> to the to the labels or whatever. No, I mean, I honestly don't know what it is. It's a it's a it's a feeling you get from the music, and a feeling that you just get from someone. It's 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 not even like a magnetism, like a a star. You know, people say star quality. Mm. I, I mean, what's Dave's star quality? Mm. you know he's 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 dave he's dave yeah. he's just yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a different a different kind of guy you know would i mean stormzy lights up a room when he walks in but it's 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 like a physical presence in a way isn't it and you see you know this huge guy with this huge yeah. smile there's like an aura yeah. but i don't think you'd say you, you maybe say for idris elba has has this sort of slightly different presence but in terms of in terms of music it 
I honestly don't know what what the answer is, but it's it's <clears throat> it's some kind of desire within the artist to 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 make great great music, and I think the vulner vulnerability is is key because I think the vul vulnerability keeps you grounded and enables you to to see things for as they really are, and I think that 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 in itself is is very humbling. So I always get a gauge of when you talk to artists like really where they think they are and I think that it's all well and good if you speak to someone and they 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 may be having delusions of grandeur where they're they feel maybe they're at a place which is mm. bigger than where they actually are but that for me is a I smell trouble at that point because because right. you you sort of hit the hit the glass ceiling at that point whereas yeah. I think that the majority of artists, great artists that I know and constantly beat themselves up and, and are constantly measuring themselves against the greats, the greats of today. And then even if you get to that point, then... Legacy. Then legacy, because yeah. I guess Adele, well, I know, would, would be saying, well, yeah, I'm, I've obviously, you know, done pretty well, but, <laughs> but how many records did mm. Ella Fitzgerald make or... Mm. Carol King or whoever the 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 people were back in the day. So yeah, I think as 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 a as as a producer, then I guess a lot of components other than music go into making records. And would you say that you've had a hand in in managing an artist like Adele or like a Stormzy, their expectations of themselves when it comes to making music with them? I think. I think the conversations are, are everything in the studio for me. You know, I think it's, you know, like Adele, the, the most amazing voice in the world. Mm. You know, Stormzy is just a force of nature. You know, Dave's lyrics. But the thing is, is that I think to be a to be a good producer, you've got to listen and you've got to you've got to to understand the 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 vocabulary and try and translate. Not literally, but when people say one thing, they could mean another. But really, to to understand like the aspirations and the goals, and and what the insecurities are, and where the 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 spots are that that need support. So I would say I'm one of those kinds of producers. And obviously, the great thing about music is that that there's so many different shades within within the colourful spectrum. But for me, I'd definitely say there's there's a lot of talk, yeah. You know, and and I think you get you really get to the, to the, to the mm. crux of what's important at that point. And then, I think that once you've, once you're on the same page, like the music becomes really fun because you're not, you're not clashing heads or you're right. not you're not you're not in both in the dark like trying to stumble around for something. You 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 you've kind of set the controls. You've got the coordinates, and then it's a lot easier to move forward. Have you had any great? experiences with with an Adele um outside of a studio the thing with Adele is that when we met and we worked for a week in the studio writing songs it was amazing amazing time I think that she she runs like the studio time she she was there bang on whatever time we agreed to start let's say 12 and then six she had a car coming and I think that right. She really values her her time out of the studio as much as in it. So you know, there's a real framework to getting in and really working hard, and then and then leaving the studio. So in that week, it's not that long to 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 socialize. I guess we we were really focused on on making the music work. But obviously, yeah. obviously, artists that I've, I've worked with. You know, for well, say Kano for years and years and years. Yeah, there's definitely been, there's definitely been times. The only thing is that, as you get older and the artists are naturally younger that you're working mm. with. So say, you know, when when I was first working with Kane 17 years ago, I don't know what our age gap is, but you know, it's it's like I was kind of older brother. <laughs> yeah. Then working with Stormzy and I was probably old enough to be his dad and then <laughs> <laughs> as it gets you know the, the socializing maybe you know for them is um you know maybe not the thing they don't want to be socializing with, right, with right. someone but that's fine for me as well because um 
I was actually laughing about it with Dave last night. You know, he was like, <laughs> you know, you're such a routine guy. He, he said, you know, I, I could bet if I called you at one o'clock, you'd definitely be in bed one in the morning. I was like, yeah, no, I, I definitely would <laughs> yeah. be in bed. So just don't call me at that time. In fact, I, my best time, because I get up super early, we have dogs, so the dogs need taking out. So I'm up at six, but I know I can always get an answer from Dave. As soon as I get up, I'll talk to him. He hasn't gone he to hasn't bed. He hasn't gone to bed. Yeah, yeah, I'm just waking up. So I'm kind of like always a day ahead of him. But Have you, have you? Um, I mean, speaking on Dave, um, obviously he's he's on the, the new record from your new album, which we'll talk about <laughs> How, I mean, I don't want to ask how was that working with him on Psychodrama, but what what made it special? I think the the relationship that we'd, we'd built over the two EPs, I think was incredible. To to then lead into the album, it felt right. supernatural and, and we've obviously very relaxed around each other. The relationship that, that I... I'd built obviously a strange relationship because um, he's he's in prison, but Dave's brother, you know, being able to talk to him occasionally on the phone, but having gone to see him in prison, knowing how how close Dave and Christopher are, hmm. you know, so to 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 develop that relationship and to actually have just seen the dynamic between the two of them musically the way that we were able to be super relaxed and him they playing piano or me playing bass or guitar me knowing that or him knowing the way that I work but also that I'm going to push him but but I've always got his back mm. I think that 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 leads to special music you know and you have that sort of relationship it's like really I always look at these relationships like because I was in bands when I was a kid, and that's yeah. that's that's Geronimo the, the, Road. Yeah, good, <laughs> good digging, good digging. But I think that when you have that relationship, like you're in a band, and that's really what it is in the studio for me. You know, you have lots of fun, you have loads of jokes, but ultimately, like you've got each other's back, you're there for each other, and I think that that's that's such a special thing. I always used to find that the the kind of transactional, almost like speed dating type of songwriting was was never for me because I could never really get to know someone in that short amount of time right and it's kind of a bit of a lottery in terms of whether you're going to get something good or you're not so typically speaking then when you do develop those relationships does it tend to be more commercially successful I mean yes and no like I I think you know the interesting thing just just being really honest is that you know I feel so grateful to be able to talk about Made in the Manor and Gang Signs and Prayers, Prayer and Psychodrama, but there's been a few records that I've made that, that haven't done so well, that were maybe great learning experiences or where maybe the artists weren't ready in the same way as the artists that I mentioned were, or mm. for whatever reason, me not being good enough. You know, so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting one. I'm not sure that it, that it, leads necessarily directly to commercial success right. but i think it it definitely will lead to success it depends how you define success yeah, of but course. in terms yeah, of yeah. expression and in terms of in terms of freedom and and creative excellence i would and, say that and, that's and how you feel about it as well yeah, yeah i think that's what we were chasing with with all three records i mean as mm. as time went on i could see the pressure was building because there was obviously so much success associated with with Storms even before he he came in to start yeah. working on the record. So that pressure was something we, we had to actively try and manage. Manage. Yeah. And the same with Dave. But with Kane, my career had sort of hit a bit of a full mm. stop and I wasn't sure what to do next. And I always say this to people because I think it's it's really good for people to hear this. But when we were making Made in the Manor, we were just two friends that wanted to make amazing music. Kane wanted to make a very <clears> introspective <throat> record, more introspective than anything he'd ever done. And and without sounding crass, a lot of the record companies came down and were not wanting to sign him. Or what did want to sign him, but maybe just yeah. couldn't get the authorization. No, I, think, I think there's a really um, interesting dynamic when it comes to Kano. Um, I feel like the Made in the Manor album was one of very few 
in recent times of that genre to sort of constantly grow with time um it might i mean it obviously had a, a massive impact when it landed but there was something a bit more maybe spiritual is the wrong word but there was something something there about that album and maybe about Kano as as as, as an individual as well mm. absolutely yeah and yeah. i sort of feel like timing is everything as well with records and i think that 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 record came like way it's hard to believe but way before this this new wave of yeah. UK rap hit. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, I'm always at pains to to credit Kane with with just, you know, whether it was going to be successful or not, he was going to make that great album. And I think that that opened the door because of the way that he expressed himself on that record. I, I, I really think it opened the door for artists like Stormzy and Dave and Jay Huss to, to come through in terms of like being introspective and being being able to be heartfelt on on bars so yeah absolutely man let's talk about the new record okay <laughs> so we've got a is it right to say a debut album from from yourself it is right to say, yeah. yeah um yeah. Uh, under the pseudonym future utopia what what does a future utopia look like future utopia for me is is a place that I would love to live in that is filled with kindness, equality, where there's understanding, where everyone gets along, where art is balanced with commerce, where <laughs> where egos are left at the door <laughs> before you come in. <laughs> I think the world would be a better place and I, I think that the the name future utopia i chose that because one i didn't want this to feel like this was a classic producer record where the temptation is for people to think that you know i've called my friends in and you know i've got stormzy and dave and kane right, right. and all my other friends on the record to to do their thing but this is more of a concept so the idea of 12 questions is is to to ask the most incredible minds in in poetry, in rap, in activism, in singing, to to give me and everyone that's listening their their interpretation of these big, deep, far ranging questions. Is it their stature that allows them to offer an insight that you wouldn't be able to find elsewhere? I don't think so because because on one hand, Storms is on the record answering the question but then I'm equally as excited about working with Tia Karras who's pretty much a new artist coming through right. and Jelani Blackman and and Arlo Parks who's blowing up but at the time that we worked is was was, was yeah. relatively unknown so yeah. so that peppered with an amazing abstract artist called Katrin Fridericks who's been campaigning environmentally for a long time the poet laureate simon armitage mm. but also the ex-black panther albert woodfox who was yep. incarcerated for 44 years yep. in solitary confinement so there's a huge huge range of of artists and activists and and spokespeople on this record that that i'm really proud of and and i think that it gives us a such an, an incredible insight into the way that we're all living in the modern world i'm really interested to hear about the albert woodfox um scenario how did you even get in contact and and what was it about his story that that sort of told you i need him on i need his voice well the the questions came first so i was waiting for the studio where we sat to be built and i just had like a laptop and some speakers in in a room in the house so just to have always have to create so i have to have somewhere that i can yeah. create in and i wasn't sure what the next move was you know i didn't i was honestly like i said i'd come to the end of these three amazing records and great experiences and everything else i really wasn't sure what the next move was so i was reading the paper a lot and, and really getting into to news and what was going on and just 
came up with these 12 questions and I honestly didn't know whether it was going to be like a Netflix documentary or a mm. film or but then something told me that that these questions would be great if they were answered by yeah. some amazing people and I could have fun making the music that for me was so personal that maybe I hadn't put onto records before so that really appealed so I I came up with the concept this was going to be the record and and one of the questions was what's the cost of freedom so so I'd never heard of Albert Woodfox before these questions but I was just then thinking about all these questions and and I was reading the paper one day and, and Albert Woodfox came up and you know page 13 or whatever and I read his story and then googled him and learned more about him and you know the fact that he was he'd served he was the longest serving solitary confinement prisoner in america yeah so 44 years and in a six by three feet cell which is i mean i, I honestly can't no. understand that um for 23 hours a day and yeah that just just that whole story so we we tried so many different ways to get in contact with him. I mean, it's not like you can just like DM him on, on Instagram or something, you know, it's, it's, it's different to that. Mm. So contacting his publishers cause he released a book. Yeah. And then we eventually got in contact with a lady that had helped free him. who was living in Hawaii and she put us in contact and then, and then I felt weird to, to, to even ask any of his time because right. I thought, you know, look, this record's super important to me, but, you know he he's getting on now he's in in his mid 70s and i was just thinking like after that amount of time in prison you you probably be you just know ready life. just to kick <laughs> yeah, back yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do whatever you wanted to do without you know talk talking to me and on my record but but he was so gracious and so such a wonderful human being and and suggested that I come out to new orleans so i flew out pre lockdown wow. to talk to him and sat like we're talk, talking now and in his front room and talked to him for two hours and recorded it and just an absolutely life-changing conversation you know to see how someone like albert that's been locked up for so many years just has no resentment and has no negativity and is all about the future and positive and how he can his story can help change the terrible things that are still going on in mm. in in the judicial system in America and how that can translate around the world and just such a positive human being. And then it's really interesting then the feeling that we're, we're moving into, or at the time we were moving into the first lockdown and how his words are so positive, you know, in terms of being able to free yourself in your mind, even though you may be locked up in a cell 23 hours a day, you know, he made the conscious decision to be free mm. at, I think he said 44, 43. So, so essentially 30 years of solitary confinement where he felt free because he, he chose that. And I think that that conscious decision to choose what you want to do is so empowering because I think we are all, we can all be down about lockdown and, and don't get me wrong. I, lockdown has obviously been incredibly challenging for, for so many people and, and the, the frontline workers, key workers, you know, but, but I think that if anyone can hear the the album and take something away from what Albert's saying, it, it should be that, that there's hope and that mm. for someone like that to be able to speak so positively, it does it definitely puts things into perspective. That's incredible. I mean it's it's also incredible that you sort of had that conversation and that connection just before everything started to really flare up mm. um globally. Mm. What was this was I mean it feels like almost this album is coming at a, a, a perfect time, as it were. Um, w was that in the back of your mind, or was it just? Is it is, are these twelve questions just something that you felt like you needed to get out? Well, I think these twelve universal questions, you know, cover everything from from freedom to faith to fear to connection and division to to AI to the environment. Mm. So I, they they apply to everything, but as events have unfolded in terms of lockdown and the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd and 
the, the where spotlights are being shone on different areas of 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 the world, even in the 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 U.S. election at the moment, mm. it's really interesting how the light is then shone back to the album and and everyone's commenting on mm. it, even though they didn't know they were commenting on it. Right. You know, tears. Tia Karras's verse on Do We Really Care felt like almost a precursor to to everything that's happening now with Black Lives Matter and that was written way before. So it's been it's been really enlightening for me to to see these words and just see how they, they fit. Right. And it'd be interesting to see in five or ten years time whether they still resonate and I think they will because because the artists are speaking and the luminaries are speaking their universal truths and those truths are are going to be universal until we have equality until racism is a thing of the past that that is this terrible thing that happened years ago and mm. that, you know and, and until the wealth gap is closed and until we we know that people are being responsible with ai and still <clears throat> until we know that the the planet isn't being burnt down and and polluted you know so it's, it's been i've learned so much which was the 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 idea of this was if i can learn something then i can share the knowledge hmm. and there's been a lot of learning going on musically and and philosophically and philosophically and and in terms of socio-economic and environment it's 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 really been like a incredible experience Amazing. One of the questions, as you just mentioned, is is do we really care? Uh, part one and two. So part one, you've got the loving spoonful sample. Um, you know, it brings 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 a sort of warm nostalgia, but then it's also sort of contradicted with with this really sharp, ferocious, um, sort of attention demanding bars from Tia. And mm. um, can you tell us a little bit how, about how that record came about? It was an interesting one because I I came into this studio and as it was being built, just to check, see how everything was coming along and, mm. and one of the builders, Paul, had Planet X or Planet Rock on. One of these stations that I typically wouldn't listen to yeah. and there was just was just playing. He was talking to me and I heard this sample, I thought, oh, it's this song, yeah. The Loving Spoonful, I thought, wow, it's that's really cool, but what struck me, and, and again, I have to say this was pre-lockdown, what struck me is that the lyrics are kind of weird and that they're, in, in the context, it's, it's kind of dark, you know, in that mm. not a shadow in the city, walking around, people looking half dead, hotter than a match head. You know, it's, it's weird. And obviously, fast forward to, to this summer, that's what I mean about stuff resonating yeah. because it, it, I couldn't have predicted that, but actually that, that hook is, is so weirdly kind of yeah dark and foreshadowing and, and, and for yeah, yeah, yeah for the times um so i had the the sample and then tom did a great job of of singing that sample mm. tom grennan mm. we actually sent down a um hard disc recorder to him in like full lockdown and a mic that we said let's just keep it don't don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't worry it's a new <laughs> mic it's been completely disinfected <laughs> Um, so he kept it and literally we waited while he was recording and then picked up the, the hard disk recorder and, and um, brought it back and his vocal was incredible. And then Tia came in and we had a long mm. discussion about do we really care and I think mm. that she'd had some experiences that were challenging in that I think her relationship with her family was, was strained at a certain point as as it, it is for lots of young people um and she she had some challenges that she wanted to talk about and obviously challenges as a as a black female growing up in in london presented its own set of challenges so so she loved the beat i loved what i'd heard her doing before so i thought she'd be perfect on it and then i just took a gamble on on her coming in and and hearing that music and connecting with it and and being able to to write and flow and we did that in a day and wow. just listen to it back and just think she smashed it on every level 
How did you come across her? That's a good point. I th- I think it was surfing social media and just you know how you one thing leads you to another yeah. and um she's managed by a, a friend of mine called Zion and I knew Zion known Zion for for a long time and we were able to connect and uh, told him how highly I thought of of uh, Tia and and yeah next thing we know she's in the studio and to get this great energy and and um yeah it was interesting that most of the most of the records that we did were around, around that kind of format mm. where I'd had the question developed the track and then the artist came in and and we just had like a long philosophical co- conversation. conversation and then we'd we'd then get down to like well they get down to writing the lyrics mm. and and I'd be there for input incredible then we move on to uh, the latest release, which is featuring Dave and it's mm. Children of the Internet. Um, one thing that I've, I found quite incredible, really, is is the fact that the the subject matter is is obviously something we're all aware of. It's it's the social dilemma, as it were. Um, but then you have like a twenty two year old male from London talking about it. And I mean that speaks for obviously Dave's, you know, his his individual maturity and whatnot. Um, but just the juxtaposition there is almost, it's, you know, it's, it's it's noteworthy. Yeah, it's crazy yeah. how he's able to. I guess it's, you know, every amazing creative, you know, is able to to see what's going on around them and just take those elements and put those into great art. You know, and Dave's just such a great example of of a great artist that does that. He also was saying that he's not a child of the internet. Right. So when I first talked to him about this, which I think was a long, long time ago, that was, I think, back end of 2018, when he had that title, which I loved. And he was saying, his experience was that he he remembers experiencing life pre wi-fi and Mm. so feels that he remembers that human interaction sitting on the sofa playing fifa with his brothers and and just feeling that you know even though you're looking at the screen but feeling he said that the thing that changed it was obviously wi-fi but i think it was the xbox one where you could really start to play against people virtually Mm. and that always stuck with me that what kind of haunting um, how clear the delineation of age and generation is it's so quick now that you can be a child on the internet and then if you're older than this time then you're not you know and how he's seen the the changes with with like the younger generation that that have you know this wealth of of information to draw on but but ultimately human interaction is struggling because of that Mm. and i think that he puts that so incredibly into into words into his flow yeah as does the artist on the track as well as devlin as devlin um yeah even with her outro i mean you probably would have listened to it but the fact that the phone is being placed in between the individual and, and the environment mm. um do you do you see technology as a uh, a frightening thing i think if you use correctly you know i think I think, you know, going back to what I was saying before about the questions, that we're all like in our natural state. I think humans, you know, we we're, we're intelligent. We we have curiosity. We have consciousness, and I think that the intelligence enables us to to do amazing things like travel to the moon and and create all these incredible platforms for mm. connection. And at heart, all these things are great. But I think then ego gets in the way. And the problem with ego is that that's, that's contrary to our human nature. So that's where AI can either help us or destroy the planet. Because if you want to get those little bots which come and, you know, are artificially able to potentially destroy nations, right. you know, with a, with a click of a button. You know, and the intelligence within them, because AI lacks consciousness, it will just go for the quickest way from A to B. And that's, that's, 
terrifying. In the wrong hands. In the wrong hands. But ultimately, artificial intelligence in, in its early form was, was meant to, to enable us to have utopia because it, it would basically do everything for us. For us and we yeah. do get a, a sort of dumbed down level of artificial intelligence in terms of being able to turn the heating in your house up whilst you're travelling home from yeah. from football match or whatever. But it, I think that's like a not technically artificial intelligence, but I think you can see the sort of point that I'm making. But mm -hmm. obviously, when it gets you right into the, into the wrong hands and ego takes over, then, then it's, a, it's a dangerous place. And I think you can say that with, in answer to any of the questions, you know, fear or faith and why we're divided when we're so connected. It's, it's not really Dave ranting about about phones or connection it's just that that it's very easy for us to to just be constantly checking our likes on instagram or mm. or doing the things that that really this technology is not designed to do i mean really you know lockdown has showed us that like zoom and facetime are just the most invaluable thing i never really used those platforms before no. even on my phone every facetime was you know we'd got into the thing over lockdown of facetiming my mum and dad every week you know which is like a brilliant thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes i wouldn't be able to speak to them for mm. for a month whereas that was a thing that we all did and we'd just sit around and you know it's really positive but there's always the the yin and yang of all these things so trying to stay conscious to to the positives and the negatives and i think that's that that sums up children of the mm -hmm. internet i think it sums up um life at the minute <laughs> it feels like well i mean how how realistic do you feel a future utopia is i think that lockdown has given us all a chance to to look inward mm -hmm. i think that the the negative sides of our our planet are really being exposed, which is, I think, you could say, it's a I think it's a great thing. I a think, really yeah, great. Thing. I think it's almost self cleansing. Yeah, whether it's whether it's far right fascist movements can be exposed, lack of fairness and kindness and equality and diversity are just being exposed. It's just mm. the light is being turned on. So change must come yep. from that. And I think that you have to stay positive. I think that by putting the lights on, it does show us how far we've got to go. Um, but I personally do feel that, 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 that the change must come. And, and with hope comes change and with, with, with enlightenment in terms of you know some of the terrible injustices that are are going on but also the interesting thing is that you know the things that make the headlines are, are very important but it's it's also interesting how that filters down into everyday life and right. i think that what's been great about lockdown is that it's forced people to to really like check in on themselves in mm. terms of like the way that we're all living on a very subtle basis in terms of how equal our, our our lives are how diverse how how kind are we how how worldly are we how read up on colonialism are we mm. all these things which which i think have have been very empowering for everybody and very enlightening and and i think that there's a lot of people that that rightly have been have been checking themselves because because I don't think the world really could have carried on in the way that it was pre-lockdown it was almost as if it's something that was there to 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 just put a little pause on society because there's only so long that that certain things can keep going on before huge change has to has to arise absolutely what's your hope for the album I think the hope is that on, on, on a deep level that, that people connect with the questions and the answers and, 
and that in whatever way it can help raise debate and argument and enlightenment and consciousness hmm. because that's questions are designed to do that you know they're, they're, we're asking questions not in a in a gentle way you know in a philosophical way in a deep or immediate way you know but if if music can help to do that then then it's mission accomplished on whatever level and then i think musically i'm hoping that people get into the music you know can actually hopefully i think people can listen to the record on on a on a dual level because you get super into it and mm. google albert wood fox and and, and learn about his story, which I'd really encourage everyone, anyone to do because it's just incredible. Mm. But, but also hopefully you can listen to it and you can enjoy you can it. Feel some of the yeah, bass yeah. lines and yeah. enjoy some <laughs> of the drums and the, the chord changes. I mean, I've, I've put everything into this and everything that I've learned is a, it's sort of a byproduct of everything I've learned. And I've used the best musicians that I could. I've, I've, I've literally sweated blood of this album to, to make it in a kind of most authentic way I could, you know, with with just the the, the care and the craft that I put into it has, has been such a great thing, you know, such a joy and such a, a privilege, but it's, I've, I've, I haven't taken the easy route. I've gone the long way around, mm. and I think that that's really the way I like to make records, but it's, it's I hope it shows and I hope people get into it, you know, the warmth warmth of those mixes come through and and people can can enjoy it and and see it for what it's meant to be incredible there's a as we wrap up you know there's a lot of um new talent on the on the album as well um one sort of guy that i've, I've spoken to before and his sort of correct me if i'm wrong but being under your wing is uh 169 can you talk to me about him a little bit? And I mean, I just have to, I have to get your perspective on it. Um, what was it that gravitated you towards him? I think the thing is with, with Terrell is that we started working together on the first Dave EP, yep. Six Paths. And his, just his choice of rhythms and drums and, and chords, bass lines. I'd never really seen anyone come through that, that had impressed me as much as Terrell. Obviously, Dave felt the same way, mm. you know, and he's no fool. You know, I, there was something about what Terrell was doing back then that, that just felt like he'd be on a par with, with any American producer. Then I got to know him, and like one of the nicest guys, you've met him, super soulful mm. guy we get to meet his family his lovely sister Shamika his brother Terry like it's it's just so much love in that family so much kind of music and art that that I wanted to sign him so so signed him to my publishing company 70 Hertz and really as a as a mentor you know it was like he wasn't the kind of guy that was going out writing every single day I just I just wanted to sort of put pen to paper to to feel like I had his back right. for a certain amount of time and you know his his rise over the past few years has been absolutely incredible he yep. continues to and he shifted into the artist side as well yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and that was something that always impressed me you know his his singing voice and I brought him in then to a few different sessions with different people just to see how he'd get on so we did stuff with with Craig David and Mabel and just to see, you know, it was interesting how his melodic touch worked in those kind of rooms as well as when we were working with stuff with Dave. And yeah, he's he's present on the record. We we worked on Do We Really Care together. He did some additional production on that for me and then we we came up with the beat for Am I Built Like This with okay. with Getz and Jelani Blackman together so are we going to hear that before the album sense. comes out or well there's not i mean the time is ticking now yeah so it's only a couple of weeks it's only a couple of <laughs> weeks so um, i'm not going to release that before the record but then the fun 
strength starts in terms of everyone being able to hear the record, but then what comes, what comes next, yeah. what happens yeah, next. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there's, there's lots of options for singles and there's, there's lots of variety in the record. So it could go, could go one of many ways, but as long as what I do, which is, is a given that any re single that I release will hopefully draw people to the questions and to the album, then, then the job's, job's done. What's your deepest motivation? Um, never feeling good enough, I think. Feeling that. So many things in production and writing and now being an, an, art, an artist that that you, you have to do. I mean, I, I wasn't a child prodigy at school, that's for sure, so I feel like a late starter, you know, I had a, a whole career as a session player and a session gu guitar player before I even got into production, you know, which is when I was like 28. So I'm just constantly like a student of of life and music and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing piano a lot, I'm practicing guitar a lot, I'm wanting to learn more about Fruity Loops and drum programming and yeah that that's the biggest motivation that's what gets me up in the morning and not in a negative way but just dinner you know, like there's so much more to learn there's so much more to give there's so much so many more beats to make and mm. so many more records to make and and artists to help that that all those motivations mean that yeah i don't get much sleep but <laughs> it's fun i have a great great time i normally wrap on uh, a question but it might be a little bit redundant with yourself <laughs> Uh, which is, do you prefer the stage or the studio? <laughs> mm. Well, I guess I spent a long time on stage, you know, before before this life as a producer. In, as in, in John Rimmert. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot, lot, of, lot of gigs. Um, but I, it's a tough one because I think, you know, this, we definitely want to do, do a live show. Yeah. For 12 Questions, and I think that I'm really... Really excited about that. We did a live performance of Do We Really Care? Okay. Just coming out soon. And I'm rehearsing up the song with Arlo Parks to do a TV performance next week. And that's really fun. So I think to have the, the ability, for me, I think the ability to make a song in the studio, but then to take it live is, is just an amazing, because you get that immediate feel of mm. whether people are into it or not. And just to, to have a look in see the look in people's eyes when you're playing something new is is special so i have to sit on the fence and say both actually for that good man <laughs> and uh final thing what was the first piece of music you remember getting hold of um well i guess the way you like, held that was like a piece of vinyl no, right? yeah i mean that was a loaded uh <laughs> yeah um i think jimmy hendrix live at monterey was the thing that really like sparked my love of guitar. guitar yeah. It was always there. It was always like lying in wait, but then I just heard Jimi Hendrix and I just thought, wow, that's that's back to the drawing board in terms of practicing, but <laughs> who is this guy, you know? Incredible, man. Fraser, amazing to meet you. Thanks so much. Really man. appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Appreciate you coming in. All right, good, thank you. Cool. Yeah.